right. So uh, here we are. Uh, this is uh, January 18th, occurrence of the work group, combined work group meeting. Uh, first up, I have a couple of topics I like to discuss. So um, for those of you who don't know, this release for 117, we have one RN uh, from Intel who backed off at the last minute. And so we had to um, resort to the, the original secondary RM, Marion, and then Paul from Tetrid uh, to become RNs. Paul has, uh, he's new to the, the community and uh, he's not yet a member of this deal. So he cannot be an RM at this point. So we just need another secondary RM for looking over PRs and proving PRs. That'll make things go a lot smoother. Uh, I just want to give a call out to the community and uh, ask if there's anyone who can step up to become the secondary RM for just this release. John? Yeah, if our only concern is that Paul's not a member of the org, um, that's like the lowest bar. Like you literally need one PR. Okay. Um, I was personally fine with just approving it without a PR because like I said, it's like the lowest bar. But if not, I mean, that would take him, you know, 15, 20 minutes probably to fix a, a low hanging fruit. Um, would that solve things? Okay, uh, if the bar is that low, then I will work with Paul to um, get and submit. Is it any PR? Does it have to be a co-contribution? No, it could no, be done. literally anything. Yeah, okay. I was I, I think planning to a, work with, yeah, go ahead. I was Eric. gonna say, we need a, I think we need a, a cherry pick label added maybe in the bots repo if if i think the milestone was already added but we probably need a cherry pick label if uh that that should be a fairly simple pr okay sounds good let's go do that that's easy thank you the um in, in the past i think we have looked for two release managers per release that have some sort of experience not as a qualification or a bar to meet or anything like that just as a this is what you'll need to be able to get the work done. Um, uh, sorry, I missed who Paul would be partnering with. Is that Nick? Merriam from uh, oh. IBM. Well, yeah, if he's got Merriam working with him, I bet they could. Merriam, how do you feel about that? Yeah, I mean, I've been I've been doing this one, and uh, you know, Eric has been helping me as well. I I did touch base with Paul today morning, and then uh, thought we could work with him just to get to the PR submitted. That should be a fairly easy thing to do. Um, but in the meantime, you know, I've been working with uh, Eric to get the branch cutting process going on um, while we get him uh, set up uh, with his PR, so that he is ready for the, the release manager from tomorrow onwards probably hopefully it's late for him he's in the uh, uk time zone right now so yeah the the other well, comment you. the other comment i'll make is the way we've been trying to do it to, to extend a little bit on uh, what mitch said is is we sort of have this primary secondary shadow um so the so paul was supposed to be a shadow this release and Miriam took over for tong who went from shadow to secondary so she's released secondary the problem is is we had our primary release manager back out so um so we're sort of kind of moving people up and around um so we do have the you know sort of the minimum bar which is you know we need two people you know typically one release manager to create prs and one to approve um but if there is a third that would be okay i i, I personally volunteered to do it um the issue i have with that is that means we have two I, you know, two IBM release managers, which may or may not be construed as favorably. Um, but other than that, um, we're, we're making at least due for the, the brand cut today, I hope. Thank you, Eric. Yeah, I, I consider you um, for arm duty as well, but for the reasons you stated. Yeah, I, I'll still help as much as they need me, so that's fine. Well, I think every release you've been helping also. Thank you very much. I don't know what we could do without you. All right. So uh, with that settled, let's move to the second topic here. Uh, so as part of preparation for a CNCF graduation, uh, we need to curate the Istio ecosystem, uh, the repos under the Istio ecosystem directory here. 
And um, the tracking issue is listed here. Mainly, we're looking for volunteers to go through this directory and uh, essentially clean it up, right? See, is there it, it confirm that it's part of the Istio project um, or archive the repo if it's uh, irrelevant so that we can get this all tidied up uh, before we go to CNCF graduation. So, are there any? So I want to, this is a page produce an update. Ah, I see. That's a slightly different yeah, topic. Ignore, ignore that. That's a background discussion, Francis. Okay. Don't need to, don't need to take me. I, I thought I thought it was meant for the Istio ecosystem. <laughs> no, no. So, anyways, uh, back to Istio ecosystem. Um, can I get a volunteer to go through this and um, curate the repos under there? Or you can contact me offline. Francis, I'm not sure there's any one person in our community who has really the authority to speak on behalf of each of those uh, repos. It may be better to just have someone act as a coordinator to communicate with the owners of the repos. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of diversity there. Uh, is there a good way to find out the owner of the repo? Yes, That's pretty much. Um, I, I guess you can find out by the like the top committers on each repo. So, is the work just to check the license? What needs to be done for each? The repo? license. Check the license, and if it's if it's if the content is unrelated to Istio, then the archive is somewhere. Okay. OK, so uh, if that's what's needed, then I will uh, I'll be the coordinator. And I'll reach out to the owner of these repo. And if there's any work that we need the community to contribute to, I'll reach out again. That's great. Thank you. Sure thing. All right. Uh, so who is this person? That's me, Nick Nellis. OK, Nick, go ahead. Sure. Hey, I'll share my screen. I'll share the doc. Uh, can you go ahead and project? Take over the presentation, I mean. Yep, yep, doing that right now. Uh, here we go. OK, yeah, so this is a, an RC for custom endpoint ordering and setting the priorities. Uh, we have a, a customer of ours that is looking to migrate from a homegrown Envoy control plane to Istio. But one of their number one features is the ability to set the order of their endpoints, regardless of uh, per client, it's going to be per client. And it doesn't relate to the client properties at all. And so they can pick any kind of labels or properties of their endpoints and decide which one can be in which order. Um, so that's kind of some context there. The current implementation of priority ordering is uh, the, the number one is locality. So based on your location as relation to your uh, the server's location. Um, and that's the most common way it's used today. Um, and then there's a second way to do ordering of endpoints, and that's by labels. But the current implementation relate takes the labels that are related to the client and server themselves. And so those aren't sufficient for this uh, customer of ours to be able to dynamically kind of order these endpoints. Um, and, I, and I go through a number of different examples. I don't know if you guys necessarily need me to go through these or want me to. Um, but it's really just showing the relation. Oh, actually, I think these first ones, I guess I can go through. These are kind of the, the requirements um, of how they would like to order them. And it's essentially being being able to use the labels on the endpoints and select by value which one is top priority and which one's next priority and so on and so forth. And so I lay out the examples here. I'm setting priority zero, priority one, and priority two. Um, 
And then, so one of their top requirements is that another client calling the same set of endpoints can have a different priority order set to them. Uh, Kassen, yeah, you can just interrupt me if you want to. I'm a bit confused because the top of your document is saying that you sh it should not take into account the, the client labels. Correct. The text is actually the opposite. A different client diff get different priorities. How does a different client get different priorities if its labels are not taken into account? It, it's not. It's their labels are taken into account into where you apply the the policy. They don't get taken into account when you compare them to the endpoints that they're they're um, targeting. Oh, I get it. So so you still use the client labels, but you use them in a different way. Only for like applying the policy. So like in terms of a destination rule, or or sorry, uh, like the way you apply the policy is can be based on the, the the client's properties, but not when you compare them to the endpoints. Okay, I understand now. Uh, my recommend is as long as the previous we don't break backward compatibilities, and I, I think we we should look carefully. I and mean, yeah, I mean I don't I, I'm not against. Any proposal as long as it doesn't break backward compatibility. Yeah, and after I propose this, we're actually going to go back to our customer, and the, they, I think they will attach their name to this, and so it'll be a pretty big win in terms of moving a custom implementation of Envoy to Istio. So there's a benefit to the community as well um, if we can capture this use case. Um, okay, so looking at the two implementations, um, failover priority currently, as I said, compares the labels on the client and then the endpoints themselves, and that's how ordering is um, established. One other issue with that is that because of the way failover priority works, the more labels that match, the higher priority it gets. And so there's no set of endpoint ordering. It's um, extremely hard to set up the second failover priority and the third failover priority if you wanted to switch them because it's all based on the label matching. And we actually went down a pretty kind of complicated road of the more endpoints you have, the more unique labels you need to set those um, later endpoint priorities. Um, essentially, it becomes like a, a pretty big scaling problem in terms of having unique labels for endpoints. Um, if that's not clear, I can go through this example too. So, on the client here, the client has the labels node, node two, color red, and then we set the failover priority to base based on these two labels, node and color. And so, if you have both of those that match the client and the endpoint, that has highest priority. Then, if one label matches, that's next priority, and then no labels matching has the next priority. So, in order to um, order the last final priority, you have to have a three, two, one matching algorithm. So the top endpoint has to have three, the middle endpoint has to have two matching labels, and then the final endpoint has to have one. And so it just kind of gets kind of nasty in that regard. Um, and so that, oh, that's right here. That goes into this um, level of um, labels you'd have to have to set later priorities in the endpoints. Um, and then, so the proposal, um, I'm not necessarily tied to any given solution. Um, I think ultimately there's going to be a need to be a third way to order endpoints. And that I called, in this case, I just call it custom priority. I'm not tied to the name or anything, more tied to the implementation. And the idea is that it removes all reliance on the client having any labels and you can use label values to set priority and then the priority would be in a top-down order in the list and so the idea is that the top label match here and it can be and and or relationships it has this label and this label or this label and then um, the next set of priority endpoints would be based on the label the next label in line in order and so on and so forth. And so that allows you then to strictly be able to set the top priority and middle priorities and then the last priority. Um, and the way the way I have this, it's like kind of essentially a list of lists of labels. And that allows you then to can do an and relationship. So uh, endpoint that has these two labels as top priority, and then you 
and so on and so forth. And then obviously an or relationship um, is also a, also a possible for these. Um, the final point is whether this solution exists in the destination rule or potentially in a new API. So I put an example here of it just being in, embedded in the destination rule. The only thing with this is that this would now be a third endpoint ordering mechanism within the destination rule. And so it's starting to look like potentially it may even be its own API that has a little bit more support for endpoint ordering. And so I I just broke out all the locality base or all the endpoint ordering uh, configuration into its own called endpoint priority. Not tied to the name, but just offering two different proposals. And then at the bottom, I I provide an example that I did with just the Envoy YAML configuration. So if people want to play with this and see, I, what I found through testing is that it's using the locality endpoint in Envoy, but it doesn't seem that Envoy honors the locality when you set priority. And so you can pretty much um, override any sort of priority just by setting them. And so I have a test here that, that proves that. Um, that's, I think that's, that's it. Um, and so I guess I'll open it up for questions and comments. Yeah, go ahead. So one thing I didn't see in your, your proposal was, uh, context selection, right? Is this presuming? Because we have some situations where people use a single config cluster and multiple uh, you know, implementation clusters. Um, and so presumably, if those implementation clusters are geographically distributed, they're going to want different priorities um, for each or for some of them. Um, since your API is kind of statically defining the priority order, it seems like we need some way to say when that applies and, and which one applies. And we need to design the, decide the granularity of that. Does that make sense? I think if I understand you correctly, in certain cases, it's not just a single cluster being routed to, it's multiple. Yeah, correct. Well, not I've not routed to, that. routed from specifically. Oh, from specific clusters. So I would uh, give you another example. I mean, uh, the, the example you have in your document with uh, with the node matching, the intent of the user is that if I'm on node A, I want to talk first with workload in node A. Or if I'm in cluster A, I want to talk first with, with not in cluster A. With your policy, you can express the same thing, but you need to write a destination rule for each client. And for each client, you need to explicitly list uh, the definition. I mean, the current API, it's a bit more dynamic in the sense that if it's the same, then it, it, it gives priority. I don't think it's wrong to have both options. I mean, having an explicit client independent order is actually quite valuable. And I don't mind having an option to do this. I mean, you can. How, how tricky it is to do to properly implement load balancing and how confusing it is to do the client matching. But you need to be very careful not to break the existing functionality and to consider how users will use it because there will be a lot of configurations if if, uh, if you take into account multiple clusters and regions and everything else. Okay, so one thing is it. Is there a limitation in the destination rule on how you can apply policies today, like destinations today? You can only apply them to a source service. And so we couldn't actually pick out individual clusters. Does that make sense? Uh, there are many ways to use destination rule. I mean, the simple way is to write it in the producer namespace and, and, and then have all clients follow use that particular destination rule. The more right, complicated it, 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 it does, destination rule does not really select its client workload. It selects the target, yeah, for the most part, right? So it's a produce, it's a, it's a rule that's owned by the producer of the service. And seeing as 
Istio treats services as globals for the most part, modulo, you know, the usage of config clusters. Um, right, things get okay. a little interesting. Well, that definitely seems like a destination rule is not sufficient for this use case. So that, that's kind of the normal and expected and common usage of destination rule. We also support putting destination rule in client namespace, but that's very expensive, very complicated. And it's, for example, the new Gamma and Gateway API don't support this very well. Right. And it's something we kind of prefer to avoid in new APIs, we're requiring that each client has its own destination rule and, and uh, the client override. Because it generates a lot of configuration, a lot of complexity, and a lot of pain for, for users. It may be necessary in some cases. I'm not saying it's not we can cover everything with only producer destination rules, but anything we can do with only producer, it will be simpler and cleaner for the user in our experience. We, we, I think we looked at numbers and there are not so many people overriding destination rules. Right, very, very few. Very few, and there are reasons for that. I mean, it's complicated, it's hard to understand, it's creating all kinds of, but again, we have a lot of options. Right, and it doesn't sound like you're making a, in terms of who's writing the rule, Nick, it doesn't sound like you're arguing for the client writing the rule, actually. But what but what your API is proposing is that the producer is able to write a rule for each client context or priority order that they think matters. Does that make sense? Yeah, in the way in the way that it's implemented in our customer, it does allow the clients to essentially set it, but there, it definitely is contextual. It's essentially saying if two teams are consuming the same uh, producer, they can decide the way they want to uh, like fail over to the producer endpoints. But do they actually do things radically different or are they all basically doing the same thing, right? Which is doing some form of structural locality. Some form of, yes. And one, one, one thing I forgot to mention uh, is, is that uh, normally uh, putting uh, label selectors in the client namespace that apply to server namespace, uh, we found in the past with Gateway and other examples that it's problematic because the client cannot control or know or have visibility always into, the, into what the producer is creating. So a producer may change the labels if they see fit and it's not, we don't want to create a tight coupling between all clients in a big mesh and the particular producer. So, the right, client so what knows. ends up happening is you only end up writing rules based on labels that are part of the platform. Yeah. And so do you mean like so I guess the Nick, one of these known labels? Yes. As a producer, I can ask clients to label with version equal foo and uh, you know, type equal application. But we cannot, exp for, for in order to use my service, but we don't want each client to impose a label requirement on label, you know, on, on, on the producer of the application. You must keep using this label and different clients and you cannot change it ever. Right, yeah, yep, absolutely. I, I think that- yeah, So in your example, okay. right, you have color red, right? That's probably really unlikely, right? Because it's arbitrary <laughs> as opposed to a standard one. Um, yeah, yeah, right. The reason I had, I, uh included like that is in the in the way if we use the current existing existing system you would need a bunch of extra labels to try and make the endpoints unique oh yeah no i, I get the so, the the, the cardinality requirement on permutation um in in your real customer example are they oh, using, am I using okay are they using platform labels or labels that the customer like within their entire fleet considered to be part of a standard right so they're really part of their platform or are they arbitrary like it can be whatever the producer does plus whatever the client thinks is important and it's the wild west i think yeah, it's going to be one of the I'll first two i i do i do think so too i was i was actually kind of taking that from failover priority because i don't think does failover priority have that restriction um, no, I don't think it, so. It, it doesn't, but that's generally the failover priorities are written by the producer, right? So they know the producer dictates what color red means. Uh, 
and and even even for for uh, you know I, I don't think it's the best practice to use arbitrary labels uh, too often because it creates a lot of problems since uh, you know they may change you may deploy a new version of application developer doesn't know that some client so uh, using standard Wait, labels it's always better yeah so one way of maybe bridging this gap. Right. If you look at your sample API, right, which you just list a, a kind of an ordered list of label match groups, um, but everything's done with constants, right? You think about uh, locality LB. Uh, you know, you could do the matches based on variables instead of constants, right? And that would allow the producer to write a rule that was structurally parameterized based on the client context. Um, uh, maybe that's right. So instead of node node two, you say node, you know, uh, dollar sign client node, right? Yeah. Um, and that that achieves a locality effect based on the consumer. And if you can write rules like that, then you don't need to write one rule per client context where this varies. Right, let's say I had clusters in every, you know, uh, satellite in an ISP, right, I could have tens of thousands of clusters. Um, and I could get extraordinarily painful. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. I'll have to take this back. And ask them how uh, sufficient, because like, if you think about a custom envoy control plane, they have complete control over how they want to structure their endpoints today. And so, I guess I need to maybe understand more fine grained about the use cases and when they, it's actually being used today. I think they just give their developers free form ability to choose the ordering. Um, yeah, so, I I mean, yeah, so I understand we, we, how that yeah. would be difficult. Yes, we, we have to be a little bit more general. Um, and we need an API that we can maintain. Right. Um, yeah, I'd so actually we... like, I, like, I like the idea of unifying some of the load balancing APIs. This form can be made more general than what currently exists for locality LB, for example. Um, The secondary um, objective, I think, that I have as well is trying to open up the endpoint ordering to be more flexible for other use cases as well, so not being so tied. And so, if we can, right, but as, as custom point, point, these points, it'll help. Right, as custom pointed out, right, that that can start to accumulate a pretty heavy amount of complexity in the system, right, and and scale pressure, right. If we're serving a different endpoint prioritization ordering or grouping for every potential consuming client right, at n squared. And that puts pressure on the control plane. Right? Like we've yeah, seen this problem right. before with destination rule. Um, so we're very careful about it. Right? I mean, just on, on the LB front specifically, all right, our we want to transition our default recommendation to elastic weighted um, because it achieves a pretty good locality effect by default while also achieving a pretty good average latency behavior by default without introducing any of the complexity into the control plane or the data plane because it already exists there. Um, so a lot of customers who are using locality weighted LB would get a pretty similar effect from elastic weighted in terms of traffic distribution they don't get a guarantee but they get similar aggregate behavior sure mm -hmm. um right so for example if the customer your, your example customer is doing this right to get a like a node local locality effect for latency reasons let's say the client and the server endpoints are on the same physical box uh, some of the time, and you want to prefer that. Um, but you also want 
right? If the, the server on the same physical box starts to go wonky, uh, then you want to be able to fail over elsewhere. Elastic weighted is going to get you like 70 to 80% of that benefit, probably. If the latency effects are real, right? If, you, if really what they're trying to optimize for is latency. Um, if they're not trying to optimize for latency, they're trying to optimize for something else. Let's say cost, like transit costs. I want to make sure my traffic goes to the local node because I pay less money for the traffic to go there than for it to go somewhere else. Right? Then elastic weighted is not a good way to optimize for that. Uh, although for many people, latency and cost are correlated, so you end up having a, a similar effect. Does okay. that make sense? Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm writing all this down. Yep. So uh, okay. Uh, well, um, it's also recorded. Uh, so I think we make the, 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 the recordings are discoverable after the fact, Francis. Yes. I, I rely on this fact because I can't take notes fast enough. Right? <laughs> if you're yeah, thinking I, I need a bug John to give me the owner, uh, give me the edit rights to those recordings so I can upload them. Oh, right, yeah, sorry. Um, In, if you're taking notes, one more uh, thing to put there on the list. Uh, uh, one one thing we've been trying is to simplify the APIs part of the gamma gateway, and I would recommend to attend you know either gamma or gateway meetings. Uh, and the idea would be to have you know simplified version of destination rule uh, that is again satisfies the requirement. I mean priority for this for producer and using standard labels and and things like that uh, that can be adopted by the entire community. So 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 we have you know we kind of. Uh, in, instead of defining a new CRD that is too specific, because I see you are, you are trying to define a new CRD at the end or to extend destination rule, if we can find something that other vendors agree on and 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 it's simplified, uh, I would be strongly in favor of of uh, putting it part of the of the upstream APIs basically. Is there uh, any work being done on uh, like advanced endpoint ordering? Not yet, but uh, they, you know, each you know, people propose features and and they propose CRDs, and it goes through a process. But the main thing is that other vendors are involved, and if it is adopted, it's it's you know more likely to become a standard. And usually, the APIs become more cleaner because again, they are forced to be a bit simpler. Yeah, but maybe put another way: while while the Gamma Group is not trying to standardize such an API right now, it would help review one. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Okay. Yeah, um, I, I guess the main worry with Gamma is uh, certainly locality priority is not something on the immediate list for Gamma, right? Because there are basic HTTP routes, uh, you know, a, a lot of design people trying to settle, you know, how do you do routes across client and server? So the thing re related is it's going to take much longer to gain consensus in Gamma that's that that that's the only concern I have. Yeah, I think well, there, there are a couple of things. So one, Gamma is trying to has put effort into standardize how extensions are attached to the API, and that is actually already codified. So you don't have to standardize the API in Gamma to follow the practice. So you can proceed having gotten feedback and make sure that you aligned with the patterns. You're not trying to standardize the API. Yet. Gamma's, Gamma is specifically designed to allow extensions that are not part of the spec. OK, so if we ha come to gam Gamma with this user case, it would just be mainly the user case as an extension policy. Thank you, Chris, for sending that link. Yeah. So you would, you would write up a, a proposal for a policy following the Gamma patterns. Uh, you know, ask for feedback from the Gamma group. Does this follow the patterns correctly? Does this make um, and then maybe later on the gamma group would take it up as part of the standard, but you don't have to, right? maybe that happens two years from now, that's fine. One other thought is, is there the pos, I know, so I know Envoy Filter is not a solution here, but is there a solution like Envoy Filter that just allows a pluggable interface for endpoint ordering? Um, I, 
I would There's work a... with Wasm. <laughs> um, it might be easier to consider that a when we do integrations with um, service discovery infrastructure, for one of a better term, for which the Kubernetes API server is one example, um, we could look to providing integration patterns where there is more structure coming from the service discovery mechanism. I think that's going to be difficult to do. Um, right, we talked about doing that with console and eventually just stopped. The only reason I ask is because if you look at failover priority, like it was written for a very specific use case, as is my implementation as well, for a very specific user. And so it seems like the way these operate are just like as, as a new use case comes in, there probably is going to be a fourth way to order endpoints. And it like and that's just well, let's let's, let's say we take for sake of argument, we say you know, that there's a standard kind of structural form where all endpoints have labels, right? And they're in the Kubernetes idiom. How many ways can you produce an order, right? You, you have a, a list of rules where each rule is evaluated in order. Uh, and if you match the rule, then you're in bucket, right? And that rule could be, you know, what you've shown here or as complicated as a cell expression, right? with ands and ors and nots and all that kind of crap. Um, doesn't really change the structure. Doesn't really change the behavior. Um, it's not clear if we need that much complexity, given the underlying model, right? You probably don't want to be doing things like nots. Um, and you could, I suppose, but um, if you look at Kubernetes and things like network policy, right? They have pretty complex expression languages to enable definitions of groups, right? The, the workload selector can be quite complicated and includes uh, exclusions. I don't know if much beyond that, Nick, to be honest. Um, and so it would be useful to know if that mechanism can be made to fit your customer's use case because it's going to make the system easier to support and aggregate. Makes sense. I will take all this feedback and um, come back later, I think. Yeah. Yeah, yes. just to recap quickly and make sure we're on the same page, I think some of the action that's being mentioned here is uh, destination rule would be tricky. I think uh, having a policy, low balance of policy, like a dedicated uh, customer resource may make more sense. And Gamma as a place would help us shape the API um, as an extension to Gamma. Well, more specifically, whether it's destination rule or a specific policy API, having it be producer oriented, is going to be way easier to support and maintain. Mm -hmm. Right. So if you look at the Gamma API, one of the things you're going to talk about if we design it in that idiom is what does it attach to in the resource model? Right. And the Gamma API model does not model the client. It models services, it models gateways, it models recs. Well, all those three things are producer oriented. And that's intentional. Um, Gus and I, in addition to Keith and others, right, having had experience with the N squared problem of attaching policies to clients, uh, you know, we have tried to avoid that complexity where possible, even if that means the policy it needs to express more complexity itself. Interesting. So there's no way to attach a policy on the consumer side at the moment for Gamma. Not really, no. And we filter, which we need to probably refine it a bit as an escape hatch. I mean, to have something more more uh, flexible. I mean, <laughs> less less powerful. But uh, the intent is to keep the core API implementable with uh, with uh, you know at scale and and uh, without and by multiple vendors and without insane complexity and cost. 
The other reason why I suggest looking at Gamma and, and even talk to the Envoy community more generally is we'll get better feedback on, on the API. So like, if we can keep it producer restricted, it can belong to destination rule because destination rule is for the most part, uh, a producer only API. It's not quite that way today, um, but it's used that way. And I think we prefer to make sure that it is that way. And if that comes at the cost of putting variables into the expression language, that might be a good trade-off. This, this specific customer deploys a single application per namespace, um, mm -hmm. given that that's just how they do things. And so a destination rule per namespace isn't unreasonable either, which would still give them sure. high yeah. side flexibility, essentially. Uh, are, are, are they multi-cluster or not? Yes. Uh, 10 clusters. They, and, OK. Uh, and are they trying to optimize for latency or cost? It's essentially a feature offered to developers to decide how they want to apply priority ordering. Well, what are the developers trying to optimize for? Somebody's making a choice out. somewhere. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I think every team can make their own decision today, but we need to go figure out what decisions they're actually making. Yeah, because that 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 that's pretty useful information in deciding the API. Um, okay. Uh, I think I don't think anybody thinks like making improvements here is a bad idea though, right? Like like I do actually I would like a more general capable API that also didn't offer as many we didn't have as many APIs like that, uh, but it's going to take a little time to work through that. Well, great. Thank you for your time. All right. Thanks, you. Nick. Sorry. Okay. Uh, so I believe the next item is uh, Sakaru. Yes, that's me. All right. So. It's still benchmarking, so quick recap. A couple of months ago, there was a topic that the Istio benchmarking doesn't work anymore, and we need to get that back online. So uh, we created this uh, uh, task list, what to do, and, and we are pretty close to the end. And uh, so we have the, the benchmarking script uh, in the tools repository. Uh, it's ready for the uh, Pro integration, that, that at least I think so. Uh, the current uh, benchmarking script, now that the Postgres uh, thing is gone, or well, it's been gone for a year, what does it do now is it's going to create a cluster, it's going to run the benchmark, and it's going to delete the cluster. And, uh, and John has some concerns about this one. And uh, I want to kind of hear, are those concerns real, or do we need to do something else? John, you have a comment there or anything oh, else? Yeah, yeah, yeah. My concern was that, um, you know, like there's a reason we had the, the Bosco system. It's that a, a test is kind of ephemeral. Um, if we say, okay, in the first part, we spin up this cluster, which costs, I don't know, $1,000 a day or a month or some, some period of time, uh, it, the pod can get rescheduled, right? And then we'll start up, spin up a new cluster, spin up a third cluster, spin up a fourth cluster. There's no cleanup guarantees. Uh, it's also extremely slow. It takes maybe five to 10 minutes to create a cluster and delete it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's also the highest privilege we can give. And, you know, the prow environment is kind of multi-tenant. We run all sorts of things on there. We're now giving access to spin up entire new clusters, uh, which basically means we give them root in that project, uh, which could be problematic as well. Um, so I'm just not sure that this is the right approach um, on how we want to run benchmarks. It's not what other projects do either. How do they do that? I mean, you know, do we want to get back? I to think the they Bosco? use the, the Boscos, but I mean, in my preferences, we're just benchmarking the data plane. So it seems really excessive that we need like a, you know, four node, four CPU each cluster just to run two envoys and send traffic between them. Well, uh, I, I I think the, the current uh, requirements for the for the benchmarking to run the the Istio there those are way over 
you know, this, this, that's too much. I mean, uh, there's like a, the requirement is like two nodes, uh, four nodes, and totally like 200 CPUs. That's ridiculous. We should totally. Cut but do we even need a home. real GKE cluster? Or can we just run them on kind? I mean, my, my preference, as I commented in the doc, was to just run them as local processes, but I can understand arguments against that. Is there how much uh, variability and noise is there if we run them in kind? I we haven't kind of a measured or or investigated that one, but uh, I mean, as I said in the in the comments, I would really like to keep that in the in the Kubernetes because we are kind of adding a little bit more complex use cases there. Oh, kind kind is Kubernetes. It's just Kubernetes running inside of Docker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you yeah, don't need to know. Which you wouldn't run a benchmark test on kind. I mean, you, you should be able to run a benchmark on kind to get kind of an idea and to have consistent, you know, revision to revision compared, you know, completely local host isolated. But one of the purposes is to verify how it works with multi-node, even multi-regions. And, and uh, so I think there are two categories of benchmark testing. One is the ones that we can do on kind or on prow, and that's very important and we should do it as frequently as possible. And, and that's, I completely agree with John that we should have this option. But then there is a stress and kind of, you know, serious test where you need a multi-cluster environment where where uh, you verify that you know under for 24 hours you 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 generate as much traffic as you possible and you verify that you don't have any 500s, and you have multiple clusters in multiple regions. You you look at all kind of metrics. Uh, that's a part where setting up an environment or having a dedicated environment would make sense. I mean, it is not completely excessive. Uh, we probably don't need 200 or 500 nodes anymore because we have tools to simulate load and on, on pilot and other things. But um, uh, I, I, I think we need to support both, both corners cases, both cases, stress test and and uh, and uh, you know regular benchmark. Sakari, so, how often yeah. are these tests run? Is this? Like I mean, uh, the, the 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 benchmarking which was there with the bus calls that was run once a day. And I don't know how long it takes to 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 set up the boss calls cluster, but you know it's true that when you create that with the G Cloud, you know it takes five minutes. But the the, the benchmarking right now, uh, the entire run is eleven hours, so it's noise compared to the entire runtime. Yeah, that's stress test. You're, 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 that's that's closer to a stress test. But even this probably could could use a reused the cluster that you you reuse and you share with the tests, which was. Well, yeah, and, and I, I don't think it's a stress test. Austin. I think it's just benchmarks are poorly written. Like it, it is literally just spinning up two pods and sending requests. So it yeah, but really there's, have any there's, there's kind of a so many so, so many variations and so many kind of a KPIs that it's measuring. I agree with we should kind of a tone down tone down uh, those you know the the amount of minutes it's going to run, the amount of you know parameters, so we can we can cut that to a you know. 20% of the time and, and still have, you know, meaningful results. And uh, and we can tone down the, the number of CPUs, number of, number of nodes and, and all that. And in terms of the, um, the, the, you know, the cost, you mentioned that the, you clean up some, uh, you know, old clusters. The way that the benchmarking, you know, runs, runs now with this, you know, create cluster, run, delete cluster, so if for for, <coughs> for some reason the the deletion is is not done, so the cluster is left behind, the next day the benchmark will pick up the the same cluster, so it's not going to spin up a new one. So you don't kind of don't start multiplying those those clusters. It's max. Well, only well then that seems problematic because it's not hermetic, right? Like True. we so we I mean we used to do this. It causes all sorts of problems, flakiness slow cost. I mean, we're spending a million dollars a month on these GKE clusters. I, I'd like to at least first see that we tried to run it on kind and it gave two unreliable results. And on GKE, it was somehow more reliable because ultimately it's very similar running on, like we're still running on GKE technically. We're just in like three layers of Docker if we run in kind. So when you say kind, are you are you mentioning the meaning that we run the, the, the local pro job which is running on the pro cluster run the benchmarking there yes so on prow you can set on the job how many resources it gives so you can give it a dedicated node uh, to avoid no noisy neighbors we already do this for the go benchmarks uh which are just like the go go test benchmarks micro benchmarks 
Um, and then all the integration tests already do kind, so you can kind of combine those to give it a dedicated node, spin up a kind cluster, uh, and run it there. The difference between that and a real GKE, I think, would mostly be that we're on one physical node instead of going across two physical nodes. So we yeah. have some issues with noisy neighbors with ourselves. Um, but given how virtualized the nodes are anyways, I'm not entirely sure how much of a difference that will make. So I, Plus, I we only need consistency between runs, really. We don't actually care about the precise number. It's just that the number is consistent between each benchmark run, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. realistically is not even going to happen if you use a real GK cluster because random nodes and GCP between them have a huge variance. Um, so we've seen that in the Go benchmarks, for example, that we often see quite high variability between the runs, even though they have a dedicated node, um, just because sometimes you get unlucky if and you get a slower node. Hmm. So Istio is software focused on microservices and distributed compute. I'm not sure I would be comfortable telling our users when they have a performance problem, oh, we never actually ran this on more than one node. Um, well, so I think that's like, that. I think we need two things, right? There's, there's one is we run real tests in real environments. Um, and if you're AWS, you probably shouldn't be happy with trusting a number run on GCP, right? There are entirely different environments that could have different quirks and whatnot. But our CIC CD, which runs every day or maybe every commit and paid for by the CNCF and, and whatnot, should be fast and easy to reproduce locally and not cost fortune and, and whatnot. Uh, like to have a script, I think, that, you know, cloud vendor could run and be like, run on extreme stress mode on my 500 node cluster. That's like, you know, super scale testing. I think that's perfectly reasonable, but we want to run that in CICD. Yeah, so I think what Sakari's put together is, a, is very similar to what you're talking about, with the exception that we would run it on some periodic basis and publish the results as a project, which is what we've done in the past, right? We've run this uh, this particular suite against a real GKE cluster, uh, and we've published the results on Istio.io so that our users have some idea of a performance benchmark. Now, there were some difficulties with the publishing. We apparently claimed we ran tests when we didn't, but uh, we're trying to fix that. Mitch, are you, are you planning to run on the, on the Istio infrastructure, or do you have your own? Uh, I, I might be interested in running it on AWS infrastructure personally, but I would expect the Istio project to run it on one real Kubernetes somewhere. I, it happens that we have a lot of access to Google Kubernetes. If uh, someone wanted that to be Azure instead, that's that's fine by me. I, I, I think it's useful to have ability to run this test on any on Azure, or AWS, Google, or whatever, with this process and then create a cluster and delete it. That's, that's useful. And if someone is willing to set up and do it, it's wonderful. Uh, but for the automated test, I think John is right that you know we have the power the using cluster, having infrastructure in place. Probably it's not worth having a one-off for this one, and, and we can get good enough results with uh, with what we have. So it is it, it's both. The answer should be both. I mean, we, we should be able to run in kind. We should be able to run on 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 prow. We should also be able to page cluster edit clusters. So this is a, a much larger scope than what we initially asked Sakari to do. Uh, we, we, you know, we talked to him in September and told him that all of our benchmarks had been false for a few releases. Could you please get that suite back up and running? Um, and, it, and it seems he has. It's a great start. I mean, if you're not saying that you do everything at once or, or you are blocked, I mean, you cannot publish results or you cannot run these scripts today. I mean. Uh, but we should strive, I mean, maybe not you, maybe someone else, to also modify this to work on, on, on kind and to work on other clusters, other vendors, I mean, if people are interested. Uh, it's better to have something than nothing, for sure. So then is the proposal that we accept what Sakari has and that someone who is interested in running these tests on kind work on that particular endeavor? I mean, given that we don't have any benchmarks today, I don't see how we could not accept it and have to have something. Uh, I would be in favor of that. But I think uh, it's a major security risk to do it. So I would not be no, in favor sorry, of people to accept, accept. Yeah, accept the PR, not run it on our infrastructure. So, so accept the PR, 
let people run it, you know, it's a release manager or, or, or someone who you know, volunteers to work it in each release. Uh, can sure, 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 sure. I'm not okay, to... so 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 the, the the scripting part is is kind of a there now. Uh, you know, you know if you if you want to run that on your own, you know, knock yourself out. It works, or famous flat word, it it should work, and uh, it's gonna push the. Uh, uh, well, okay, I'll take that back. Uh, you know, I was about to say that the the results are pushed to the Google Cloud uh, buckets. That, but we we made that uh, configurable, so you can choose whatever bucket you you like. So that's done. It's then just the the pro integration that uh, we should do differently, not to run this gigantic uh, you know script, which which was I mean, Mitch is right, that was run previously, but instead we changed the pro to run something. On a kind, but it's not blocked. I mean, you can do first uh, restore some some benchmarks, and then next release we can try to automate it with something with kind. I mean, we can we can iterate over it as, as necessary. I mean, now John and Constant, I, I, you know, <laughs> you should figure out which way we go because you're you're conflicting each other. John is saying that it's a security risk. And... No, no, it's a security risk if we put it in the automation tool today. But if you run it manually, it's a, if the release manager, for example, runs this manually, ah, okay, push it, okay. no problem. Yeah. And okay. then before you automate it for each release, because release managers don't probably want to do manual steps, then again, we'll need to adjust it to that address security concerns, which are also valid. I don't disagree with John at all on this. Okay, yeah, I got it, sorry. OK, so with that, I want to introduce that we are out of time. And uh, many people here have the next work group meeting to go to. Uh, John and Kostin, do you guys, are, are these two topics that must be discussed today, the two topics you listed? Uh, mine was kind of about ambient in many ways, so I'll just move it to the next meeting. Yeah, next okay. week is fine. No problem. Great. Thank you. Please do. And uh, thank you, folks. I will see you later.